So good morning, everyone, on this morning. Uh, I am Dr. Vinod Kumar. I am professor at uh, IRCH, uh, Onco Anesthesia and Palliative Medicine. And Dr. Sanjeev is uh, the presenter, who is a senior resident at our department. He had four publications as a principal investigator and eight publications as co-investigator. And he had presented few publication papers at uh, national international palliative care conference as well. His area of interest is artificial intelligence and machine learning in palliative care. So today's topic is uh, regarding uh, uh, nutrition in terminally advanced uh, patients. So it's quite a controversial topic in the way that uh, few people will think that people, uh, a patient should be given nutrition at the end of life and there are various thoughts that some people wants to give feed and uh, hydration and some people feel that uh, it should not be given. So we will discuss this. We will discuss uh, regarding uh, what is nutrition and uh, how to assess nutrition in patients and what are the parameters which we should focus on. And uh, then we will come to the conclusion regarding whether we should give nutrition and hydration in terminal ill patients or not. So over to Dr. Sanjeev. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So today uh, we are going to discuss about nutrition in advanced and terminal patients. So we are opening up the discussion with a case scenario. So uh, right now we will be seeing the case and then in the end of uh, our presentation, we will be discussing how to uh, solve the nutritional part for this patient. So 60 year old male known case of metastatic carcinoma esophagus post chemo and radiation. Currently patient is on best supportive care in view of progressive de decline in performance status with current ink of PS of four. Patient presents to palliative medicine OPD with complaints of progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids both and he vomits every time he eats since one week. Height of patient is uh, 1.65 meters, weight is 42 kgs. Weight loss in last three months is 20 kgs. Sarcopenia is present. Lab value suggestive of sodium 126, potassium 3.6, and alumine 2.8. So keeping in mind this case, let us let's open up the discussion. First, we will see what actually is food. So food is any nutrition substance that living being consumes in order to sustain life and maintain growth. Now, how it is important for our body? It makes us think and learn. It makes us do our work. It makes us ambulate from one place to other. And it makes us uh, enjoy the other activities of life. And combining all these aspects, we call life as healthy and active. Now, what, why food is essential? There are certain aspects. So one is uh, what common man thinks about food. Food has uh, uh, traditional and cultural values for uh, Many societies, food shows uh, love, care, and affection towards individuals. Food also provides psychological comfort. And food is an important uh, aspect which provides a good mean of socialization. Now, why food is important in a physician's perspective? So, uh, first thing is uh, food provides overall well being and uh, provides a good quality of life. It improves immunity and uh, prevents body from uh, risks of infection. It also uh, improves uh, wound healing tissue repair and it uh, helps in uh, uh, recovery of the disease and uh, it reduces the cost of treatment. Now coming to uh, uh, when nutrition becomes malnutrition. So World Health Organization has given a definition in which it suggests that uh, any deficiency, excess or imbalance in a person's intake of energy or nutrients is termed as uh, malnutrition. Malnutrition has two broad aspects. One is undernutrition and the other is overweight. So uh, in uh, today's discussion, we will be considering malnutrition as undernutrition. Now, uh, what, what causes malnutrition? There are certain conditions that can cause malnutrition. The one is long-term conditions. So long-term conditions include uh, cancer, liver diseases, lung, heart, and kidney disorder, HIV, and AIDS. Mental health conditions include depression, schizophrenia, and dementia, certain GI conditions like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and some eating disorders like anorexia and pica eating. All these conditions can lead to malnutrition. 
So uh, here onwards, the discussion will be focused on uh, advanced and terminal cancer patients who are malnourished. So what happens to nutritional status in a cancer patient? Uh, when we call malnutrition, where I mean, there is deficiency of energy uh, in form of calorie, uh, protein, and nutrients. What is the impact of uh, malnutrition in cancer patients? It uh, adversely affects tissue function and clinical outcome. The prevalence of malnutrition in cancer patients is 40 to 80 percent, and the outcome is it uh, it has poor survival, reduced benefit from surgery, poor tumor response to chemotherapy, and increased chemotherapy related toxicities. Now, uh, we have seen uh, nutritional status in cancer. Let us see what are the symptoms a uh, patient presents if patient is malnourished. <clears throat> So there are certain nutritional symptoms in advanced cancer patients that we will be discussing in, uh, form, uh, in a pattern of highest prevalence to lowest prevalence. So first symptom is anorexia. Second is weight loss. Third is weakness, dry mouth, nausea, taste changes. So all these symptoms uh, will be reported either by patient or by caregiver. So let us see how patient reports symptoms and caregiver reports symptoms. So first, we will be discussing about patient-reported symptoms. Patient reports symptoms of progressive nutritional deterioration in form of weight loss and changes in body images. Uh, altered food intake symptoms are reported in form of anorexia and GI disturbances, and change in well-being is uh, reported in form of fatigue and weakness. While caregiver-reported symptoms has two aspects, one is positive symptoms and other is negative symptoms. So positive sy symptoms are uh, hope. Caregivers uh, expect that if patient eats, uh, patient's health will be improved. Uh, food will provide comfort to the patient and food will provide uh, uh, joy to the patient, pleasure to the patient. Negative symptoms include a guilt. If patient is not eating, caregiver will be in guilt. They, they uh, expect that uh, they have put effort in uh, uh, making the food and patient is not eating. So they are uh, in a constant uh, state of guilt. Fear is an important factor where uh, caregiver thinks that something uh, worse can happen if patient is not eating. And this and all these uh, psychological symptoms can put the patient in a pain. Patient's caregiver in pain. Now let us see what is the impact of nutritional symptoms in uh, cancer. So uh, Whenever a patient has alteration in nutritional intake, it leads to consequent deterioration of health in form of weight loss and fatigue. And ultimately, it causes poor functional status and poor quality of life of patient and caregivers. So uh, what is the role of nutrition in uh, advanced and terminal cancer patients? So uh, first is, uh, what is the purpose of nutrition? Second is, what is the aim of nutrition? And third is, what is the outcome? So purpose of nutrition in advanced and terminal cancer patients is supportive. Aim is to provide management of nutritional related symptoms and outcome is to provide sense of well-being and improved quality of life. So let us see what is the purpose of nutrition in advanced and uh, terminal palliative uh, cancer patients. Uh, let us see what nutrition does not change in uh, advanced and terminal patients is. Survival cannot be changed and weight cannot be changed. While what aspects can be changed is feeling of well-being, quality of life, and caregivers' stress can be reduced. Aim of uh, so uh, on a conclusion, uh, new, uh, purpose of nutrition in advanced and terminal cancer patients is always supportive. Now let us see what is the aim of nutrition in cancer patients. So the uh, aim of nutrition is to maintain and improve food intake so that the uh, metabolic derangements can be mitigated. Uh, maintain skeletal muscle mass, whatever is there, uh, so that patient's functionality and physical performance can be maintained. Uh, maintain uh, a general state of uh, patient and uh, performance state so that uh, patient can continue anti-cancer therapy. And if we combine all these three aspects, uh, quality of life would be improved. Now, let us see why terminal illness alters nutritional status. What happens in terminal illnesses? So uh, the first thing is uh, in terminal illnesses, uh, nutritional requirement is increased. Second is uh, uh, terminal illness slows down the gastric emptying. 
it reduces absorption of food from the gi tract it uh, in terminal patients there are uh, multiple medications which causes uh, medicine induced adverse effects and psychological state is also uh, altered in terminal patients that also contribute to poor nutritional status let us see what are the metabolic consequences of cancer so the first metabolic consequence is altered glucose metabolism in second is increased glucose oxidation third one is increased protein metabolism increase a decrease protein synthesis and increased lipid metabolism now uh, we have seen uh, all uh, everything about food now let us see a very uh, important condition in uh, cancer patients and certain other chronic disorders that is known as cachexia so uh, what is cachexia as per definition cachexia is a severe and pathological loss of weight due to loss of mass of tissue other than fat and it is a serious and underrecognized con uh, consequence of cancer as well as it is a hallmark of certain disease including cancer and copd now let us see what is the prevalence of cachexia in uh, various diseases uh, cancer is the foremost condition uh, which uh, presents with cachexia followed by uh, chronic heart failure chronic kidney disease copd rheumatoid arthritis and hiv aids now what is the pathogenesis of cachexia it is a very complicated pathogenesis so we will be just looking at various pathways that can lead to cachexia the first pathway is cytokines inflammation and hypermetabolic state second is lipolysis and lipid metabolizing factors third is atp ubiquitin proteasome pathway jackstat pathway uh, cancer treatment in itself is an important cause of uh, cancer cachexia and reduced dietary intake and absorption so these are various pathways that leads to cachexia now let us see what happens in a cancer patient uh, when nutritional status is what happens to a cancer patients on nutritional status so uh, whenever a patient is diagnosed with cancer there are two conditions there is increase in pro inflammatory cytokines which include interleukin 1 16f alpha tgf beta and certain tumor factors and there is decrease in anabolic hormones like insulin and igf1 now uh, if we combine both these factors pro inflammatory cytokines increase and decrease in anabolic hormones this will lead to anorexia apart from that increase in pro inflammatory cytokines also causes increased resting energy expenditure increased proteolysis increased lipolysis and increased oxidative stress while uh, decrease in anabolic hormones causes uh, decreased adipogenesis decreased protein synthesis and reduced myogenesis now if we combine all these three anorexia increased resting energy expenditure and decreased products of synthesis we come to a conclusion that patient has developed cachexia and how cachexia presents it presents in form of weight loss muscle atrophy poor quality of life anemia and reduced tolerance to chemotherapy now let us see what is anorexia and cachexia what happens to uh, anorexia and cachexia in cancer so anorexia and cachexia is considered as a vicious cycle of death in cancer patients Uh, anorexia happens due to pro inflammatory cytokines and lactic and anorexia leads to development of cachexia cachexia is a condition of refractory weight loss and weakness and asthenia this refractory weight loss causes production of uh, pro inflammatory cytokines and lactic and this cycle goes on and turns out to be a vicious cycle of death now let us see what are the phases of uh, cancer cachexia so uh, here uh, the phase start with pre cachexia where weight loss is less than 5% patient present with anorexia and some metabolic changes then patient uh, progresses towards cachexia cachexia can be uh, defined as weight loss of more than 5% or uh, body mass index is of less than 20 and weight loss of more than 2% or sarcopenia and weight loss of more than 2% apart from the uh, apart from these a uh, reduced food intake and systemic inflammation would be there and then comes refractory cachexia where cachexia is not responding to any form of treatment uh, patient's performance status is low and expected survival is less than 3 months now uh, we so far we have seen uh, 
what are the symptoms of food what is food and what is cachexia now uh, let us see how we are going to assess patient patient's nutritional status when a patient comes to our opd or to our ward so uh, we will be opening up the discussion for nutritional assessment now so uh, academy of nutrition and dietetics has given a definition which suggests that nutritional assessment is a systematic approach for collecting classifying and synthesizing important and relevant data to describe nutritional status nutritional problems and their causes now uh, nutritional assessment is a two step process so uh, in in the step 1 whenever a patient approaches to a physician uh, or a dietitian the patient uh, the uh, physician uh, the, uh, does a step 1 procedure that is nutritional screening and if patient turns out to be malnourished on nutritional screening then comes the second step that is a detailed nutritional assessment or nutritional assessment in depth now what is the objective of this nutritional assessment the first objective is to document the basic nutritional parameters to identify the factors which are uh, 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 risk factors for a nutritional deficiencies to determine the nutritional needs to find out any contributing psychological factors and uh, at last uh, uh, very important factor that is socio economic factors so uh, i either we are going to do nutritional screening or detailed nutritional assessment we would be requiring certain parameters of nutritional assessment so these parameters would be classified in clinical parameters anthropometric parameters body composition parameters functional parameters and laboratory parameters now uh, let us uh, let us see uh, what are the clinical parameters so everything clinically starts with taking a history so first thing is history what is the disease uh, affecting patients uh, uh, food intake motility digestion and absorption diet history should be taken in depth eating habit of the patient diet components micro and macronutrients food record should be taken what patient has eaten in last couple of weeks and uh, is there any specific signs of edema or ascites and uh, in the end uh, uh, examination which uh, which includes uh, muscle atrophy subcutaneous fat and hydration status so once we have done with clinical parameters we would be looking for anthropometric parameters then anthropometric parameter the first parameter is basic height and weight measurement second is body mass index and third is uh, change in weight percentage of change in weight so uh, uh, if less, less than 5% change is there uh, we consider as mild uh, uh, malnutrition more than 5% is moderate malnutrition and more than 10% is severe malnutrition now uh, after this uh, general anthropometric measures we will be coming to uh, arm anthropometry in which we can measure triceps skin fold thickness uh, second is mid upper arm circumference and third one is uh, Arm muscle, arm muscle area using Hamsfield equation. Apart from that, uh, there are certain uh, body composition parameters which are used in research methodologies uh, to uh, find out the composition of body for different uh, type of tissues. So uh, the first is bio impedance analysis. It it is based on a resistance to alternating current provided by fat, muscle, and water. second is dual energy x ray scan it measures amount of bone mineral and soft tissue in our body uh, second is uh, third is ct scan which quantifies fat mass and fat free mass uh, fourth is uh, magnetic resonance imaging which, which also quantifies fat mass and fat free mass based on magnetic properties of various elements uh, fifth one is densitometry uh, which actually measures uh, body's total density and uh, uh, measurement of fat density and muscle usg muscle usg measures the thickness of subcutaneous fat and in the area of muscle now uh, after body composition parameters let us see what are the functional parameters that defines malnutrition so the first functional parameter is hand grip dynamometry so in a uh, in a patient of sarcopenia manual compression force in males males should be less than 27 kg and females should be less than 16 kg to uh, define the person as malnourished 
in respir uh, uh, the other functional parameter is respiratory effort in which we check peak flow and fev1 measurements and the third one is immune response in which we uh, in which patient presents with severe malnutrition and that leads to energy third is uh, next is uh, laboratory parameters so these are very important uh, uh, parameters which will be used in various screening and assessment tools so the first one is uh, uh, fall in serum albumin in acute diseases is suggestive of uh, disease severity, while in chronic diseases, it is suggestive of malnutrition. The second is uh, transthyretin, which is otherwise known as pre-albumin. It is a more sensitive marker than albumin, and the normal values are 20 to 30 milligram per deciliter. Uh, so in moderate malnutrition, it will be in between 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter, and in severe malnutrition, it will be less than 10 milligram per deciliter. The third is uh, creatinine. So uh, creatinine height index should be calculated, which is actual 24 hour creatinine excretion uh, divided by expected 24 hour creatinine ex excretion multiplied by 100. If it is more than 30%, it's the suggestive of severe muscle depletion. If it is 15 to 30%, moderate muscle depletion. And if it is less than 15%, mild muscle depletion. Third is, uh, fourth is uh, three methyl histidine. It is also a product of uh, muscle catabolism and average urinary concentration of 3 methyl is 15 to 20 micromole per millimole of creatinine. Next one is uh, nitrogen levels. Uh, nitrogen levels are also a product of protein degradation and it is a di uh, it can be measured directly by Zeldal method or indirectly by urine urea measurement. Apart from that, uh, low cholesterol levels, low lymphocyte counts, and uh, fall in transferrin saturation will also uh, represent uh, malnutrition in patient. And transferrin is more sensitive marker than serum albumin levels. So we have seen all the parameters that can be used in various screening and assessment tools. Now coming to what are the nutritional screening tools. So there are various nutritional screening tools. Uh, a total of uh, 38 I have listed here. Uh, but uh, and all these nutritional screening tools can be used in uh, various group of patients depending upon uh, available uh, resources. Uh, nothing is uh, none of them is good, none of them is bad. Everything can be used depending on the circumstances. But the most commonly used uh, nutritional screening tool is malnutrition malnutrition screening tool MST or malnutrition universal screening tool MUST. So I have highlighted those, a total of 38 screening tools are listed here. So MUST, uh, that has been developed in 2004 and it requires body mass index, weight loss and illness in relation to food intake. It can be used in all patients. So these are the various screening tools. Uh, we will be using one of these tools uh, in discussion of our case. Now, once we have done a nutritional screening and the patient turns out to be malnourished, let us go to see how we are going to do in detail nutritional assessment. Again, we are having various scales for nutritional assessment and uh, there are certain scales. Uh, so in our center, we are using subjective global assessment, which is also considered as gold standard scale. Uh, there are two forms of SGA. One is patient generated as, and one is subject uh, uh, subjective global assessment. So we are using uh, subjective global assessment scale. It is uh, for cancer patients, patients who underwent surgery and liver diseases. Apart from that, other uh, uh, nutritional assessment scales are also available like uh, mini nutritional assessment, ASPEN criteria, ESPEN criteria, and GLIM criteria. So uh, we have seen multiple screening and assessment tools. Let us see what are the advantages and disadvantages of, with disadvantages of a few of them. So a malnutritional universal screening tool is a screening tool and the advantage is it is quick and easy to use. It can be used in all clinical settings and it uh, represents past, present and future changes. But the limitations are results are influenced by the disease effect. Uh, focus, it focuses on BMI more than and it can mask nutrition, nutritional risk if patient is in overweight condition, either due to food retention or due to uh, fat. Uh, the second tool is malnutritional screening tool. It is also a screening tool, quick and easy to use. It uh, represents past and present changes, but it cannot predict future changes. And uh, 
that is the only limitation of this tool uh, the uh, the assessment tool is pgsga which is an assessment tool and it is sensitive to subtle changes in short time period and it is a gold standard tool for cancer patients but it needs patients understanding to complete it is very lengthy and requires uh, training and skill to interpret uh, it, but it also does not consider uh, future changes now uh, let us see what if patients weight cannot be measured what happens or how we will be assessing if patients weight cannot be measured so a uh, first thing we will be asking have the patient been weighed recently if if this data is not available we would be asking for patients fit of clothes and belts uh, is there any loose rings and is there any loose dentures uh, all of these clues can provide a hint whether the patient has uh, developed malnutrition or not so uh, with screening and assessment we have find uh, we can come to a conclusion that patient is having malnutrition now our target is to provide nutrition so let us see what is the role of healthcare professionals in uh, providing nutrition in a palliative care setting so uh, role of healthcare professional is to identify and address nutritional factors that impair a patient's physical and psychological well-being with the primary objective of maintaining or improving quality of life for the individual now we are coming to what is the role of nutrition in palliative care so the first is uh, pro it provides nutrients in form of energy protein vitamins and minerals it avoids malnutrition by targeting uh, uh, the target is not to gain weight but to maintain weight and uh, it provides feeling of normality as uh, eating is considered as an activity of pleasure and it avoids disparity if patient eats patient will be happy if patient does not eat patient will be sad now uh, let us see what are the nutritional deficits and goals so uh, whenever a patient is diagnosed with cancer and particularly in terminal patients the calorie calorific deficiency is 200 kilocalories per day and protein protein deficiency is 0.3 to 0.5 gram per kg per day now what is the goal to increase the calorie intake by 300 to 400 kilocalories per day and to increase the protein intake by 50% now how we are going to achieve that goal our average nutritional requirement is increased by 25 to 30 kilo calorie per kg per day and increase in protein intake by 1 gram per kg per day so this can be used as uh, this uh, data can be used as a average increment in nutritional requirement if patient is having malnourishment now let us see what are the barriers of eating so uh, the first is a difficulty in chewing and swallowing due to advanced and terminal illnesses second is nausea vomiting uh, that can be uh, either due to disease or due to the therapy and it can be uh, treated by uh, antiemetics clear liquids and cold drinks uh, anorexia and early satiety it can be due to pro inflammatory cytokines it can be due to disease or to treatment uh it this can be uh, ma uh, managed by high calorie food small meals and uh, food preferences of patients and taste and smell changes due to various therapies so a lukewarm and bland food should be given now let us see uh, what are the uh, suggestions for improving nutritional in intake in patient of terminal illness the first is feed the patient when patient is hungry second is uh, serve small portions of food Uh, gently encourage the patient to eat and do not nag. Set an attractive table so that patient feels like eating, and make food a social and enjoyable activity. What else can be done apart from that? Apart from that, uh, avoid necessary unnecessary diet restrictions. Uh, avoid complementary and alternative therapy. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, complementary and alternative therapies can be given. Unnecessary diet restrictions include. uh like uh, patient should not be avoided uh, much of salt and sugar and anything what patients likes to eat because patient is in terminal uh, terminal phase so there is not much time left for the patient so there is no point avoiding uh, unnecessary putting unnecessary restriction provide nutritional supplements in form of micro and macronutrients uh, uh, 
Encouragement by loved ones is a very important uh, aspect uh, that can increase food intake in these patients. So apart from that, we can start on pharmacological management also. In pharmacological management, the first group of drugs is progesterone, in which magistral acetate can be used uh, at a dose of 800 milligrams per day, or medroxyprogesterone acetate can be used at 1000 milligrams per day. Dexamethasone can be used in a dose of 2 to 4 milligrams per day or prednisolone in 4 uh, as a uh, 5 milligrams uh, TDS. Prokinetics can be used, metoclopramide, and other drugs included thalidomide, uh, omega 3 fatty acid, melatonin, NSAIDs uh, like ibuprofen, cyprohepatidine, and uh, dronabinol, which is a cannabinoid. Now, let us see what happens when patient is not able to eat orally. So uh, we should start on enteral feeding. Now let us see what are the cl clinical indications and what are the recommendations for enteral feeding. So clinical indication include head and neck and esophageal tumors, uh, inoperable fistulas and esophageal obstruction. Now when enteral nutrition is recommended, if there is severe dysphagia, if patient is having severe anorexia and there is decreased food intake. Now, let us see what are the methods of enteral nutrition. So we start from head. Uh, the first method is uh, putting a nasal tube. The nasal tube can be nasogastric, nasoduodenal, or nasojejunal jejunal tube depending on the site of disease or obstruction or pathology. Second is gastrostomy option that can be done in form of PEG. Uh, in form uh, percutaneous endost uh, endoscopic gastrostomy or button gastrostomy. Third one is if uh, if the obstruction is uh, in at the level of stomach or at the level of duodenum, then we can go for uh, jejunostomy. Uh, jejunostomy can be uh, done surgically. So these are the methods of enteral nutrition where we can provide nutrition directly to the gut. Now, let us see uh, what, are, what is the summary of enteral nutrition. Uh, nasogastric and orogastric tubes can be put for short term and it can be used, uh, it can be done manually at bedside. Uh, it is easy to place, allows all methods of administration, very inexpensive, but only thing is potential tube displacement and that may lead to risk of aspiration. Second is nasoduodenal or nasojejunal tube. It can... Uh, it is also a short term, uh, short term procedure and it impairs gastric motility or emptying. It can also be done manually, uh, but advisable is fluoroscopically or endoscopically. And uh, uh, it, there is a risk, uh, there is, uh, it, it allows uh, patients to, uh, it allows patients for uh, early uh, post injury or post operative feeding. And it also has a uh, uh, it also has a, a, a disadvantage of uh, uh, skills. So it requires a certain set of skills to pull or if it requires certain set of instruments like fluoroscopy or endoscopy to place it. Third is gastrost gastrostomy, which is a long-term procedure and it is done surgically or endoscopically. And... Uh, it is, uh, it is associated with certain type of infections, uh, tube displacement, uh, leakage, <coughs> uh, stoma complications and all. So uh, these things should be kept in mind before putting gastrostomy. And uh, finally, jejunostomy. That is also a similar procedure to gastrostomy. Only thing, only thing different is uh, the site of placement. Gastrostomy is placed in a stomach and jejunostomy is placed at jejunum. Now, uh, since patient is not eating for quite a few weeks and suddenly patient has been started on uh, oral or enteral nutrition, so patient can land up in a condition that is called refeeding syndrome. So what happens in patient is not eating for quite a few weeks. So uh, patients, uh, patient has a high catabolic rate and uh, because of that insulin and glucose, uh, insulin is reduced and glucagon is increased. That causes uh, increased uh, glycogenolysis, increased protein catabolism, and increased gluconeogenesis. Uh, vitamin and uh, mineral nutrient levels are low in the body. So what happens is, <clears throat> patient uh, at this point of time, patient is uh, being refeeded, 
and then carbohydrate becomes the main source of energy this carbohydrate triggers insulin secretion and once insulin is secreted insulin causes uh, increased protein synthesis sodium and water retention that will cause extracellular volume expansion uh, glucose uptake is increased thiamine use is increased intracellular shift of phosphate magnesium and potassium happens and these these uh, parameters turns out to be uh, causing hypophosphatemia hypomagnesemia hypokalemia thiamine deficiency salt and water retention and this is called as refeeding syndrome <clears throat> now coming to parenteral nutrition uh, what are the uh, when patients is uh, selected for parenteral nutrition if there is uh, inoperable intestinal obstruction uh, if patient is expected to survive for prolonged duration and uh, calculating the risk versus benefit if benefit is more we can go for parenteral nutrition uh, <clears throat> limited use of parenteral nutrition is it is difficult uh, in home care implementation uh, it is a costly uh, method of providing nutrition and there are certain ethical dilemmas also in providing parenteral nutrition now there are certain there are some guidelines aspen guidelines espen guidelines so we will be looking at espen guidelines for enteral nutrition what espen suggests there are certain general conditions that is uh, general condition include frequent nutritional assessment and early nutritional intervention so indication of enteral nutrition as per espen is start uh, enteral nutrition if patient is not able to uh, take uh, orally uh, if existing under nutrition or if patient is not able to eat for more than 7 days either it is there or it is anticipated inadequate food intake if uh, resting energy 60% uh, of resting energy expenditure for more than 10 days then we should start uh, enteral nutrition and uh, in weight losing patients with inadequate nutritional intake apart from that uh, in perioperative patients 10 to 12 days prior to major surgery if patient is having severe nutritional risk uh, in uh, if patient is on radio and chemo radiotherapy then intensive dietary advice should be uh, taken and uh, routine enteral nutrition in that condition routine enteral nutrition is not indicated until unless patient feels aphasic uh, during chemotherapy routine enteral nutrition has no effect on tumor response but it can be initiated if patient is uh, feeling aphasia and patient is not able to eat in incurable patient uh, uh, enteral nutrition provide uh, can be provided as long as patient consented and dying phase has not yet started now uh, in stem cell transplant patient routine use of parenteral nutrition is indicated parenteral nutrition is preferred over uh, uh, parenteral nutrition is uh, preferred and uh, uh, in certain conditions like if there is hemorrhagic risk of uh, infection with enteral tube placement and in immunocompromised uh, patients the uh, it it should be applied uh, in form of a tube either transnasally or percutaneous route like uh, gastrostomy or uh, jejunostomy uh, in in obst if there is any obstruction in the upper part of the body like in head and neck cancers or in esophageal cancers or in gastric cancers or gastric outlet obstruction syndromes uh, if patient is having radiation induced uh, um, mucositis if it is oral mucositis or gastric mucositis uh, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy is preferred now uh, there are certain points that should be considered while uh, ordering enteral nutrition the route of administration should be decided whether it is nasogastric or gastrostomy uh, feeding schedule should be uh, decided whether it should be given continuous or bolus uh, nursing care of the feeding should tube should be advised nutritional monitoring should be done at frequent intervals biochemical monitoring should also be done at frequent intervals uh, after that aspn has also provided guidelines for parenteral nutrition uh, so uh, parenteral nutrition can be uh, provided if energy expenditure is 20 to 25 kilocalorie per kg per day in bedridden patients and 25 to 30 kilocalorie per kg per day in ambulatory patients parenteral nutrition should be provided for 
uh, short duration and there are no specific formulation for uh, this. There are no uh, defined formulation for it. And for long period in uh, frank cachexic patient, if 50% uh, of non-protein energy is uh, provided by lipids. Now, indication for parental nutrition. Parental nutrition is harmful in non-aphagic patients. So if patient is having aphasia, then only we should start parental nutrition. And uh, it is recommended in patients with uh, radiation-induced mucositis or radiation-induced enteritis. Now, uh, the provision for nutrition is uh, supplemental parent parental nutrition is uh, uh, in inadequate enteral uh, nutrate if uh, intake if resting energy expenditure is less than 60% or it is anticipated for more than 10 days uh, parental nutrition should not be recommended if adequate oral or en uh, enteral intake is possible in perioperative patient when enteral nutrition is not possible in malnourished patient then parental nutrition should be advised during non-surgical therapy, if uh, uh, parental nutrition is not uh, recommended routinely in uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy or in concurrent CTRT, uh, but it is recommended if enteral nutrition is not possible and patient is starving for more than seven days. In incurable patient, in cases of intestinal failure, parent, parental nutrition can, can be given. Uh, if expected survival is more than two to three months and uh, uh, parental nutrition is expected to stabilize or improve performance status or quality of life, but it, it will never increase the weight of patient. Now, what is the composition of uh, parental nutrition? What is the composition of total parental PPN? It is a hyperosmolar calorie dense and usually uh, it is comprised of amino acids, glucose and lipid formulation. Uh, the calorific value is 30 kilocalorie per kg per day and uh, the protein content is 1 to 1.5 gram per kg per day. The dextrose content is 65% of total non-protein calories and 35% 35, 35 of lipid uh, uh, as a non-protein calorie. Apart from that, uh, micronutrients can be added uh, in form of uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate. Uh, it, it is prepared under sterile conditions and uh, it is delivered into high flow venous system. So, TPN should not be uh, provided in peripheral cannula. It should be provided in central cannulas. What are the complications of TPN? The mechanical complication is it can cause uh, pneumothorax, air embolism, and laceration of vessels. Uh, metabolic uh, consequences can cause hyperglycemia, electrolyte abnormalities in form of refeeding syndrome, uh, liver and liver enzyme derangements. Uh, it can cause infection at the catheter site. It can cause catheter sepsis also. Uh, it can cause thrombotic events like catheter occlusion, superior vena cava ob uh, obstruction or thrombosis. Uh, it, uh, TPN should be monitored with uh, every six hourly uh, blood glucose level until the blood glucose levels become stable. And once it is stable, the blood glucose level should be measured uh, daily. Electrolyte should be monitored daily until it is stable and then uh, every week. And liver function test initially should be done weekly and then after stabilization should be done monthly. There are certain points to consider while ordering parental nutrition. Uh, consider patient's dry body weight and uh, what is the nutritional requirement. Uh, whether there is indicate, indication for parental nutrition or not. Uh, standardized or individual mixture uh, can be used uh, nutrition uh, and uh, nutritional and biochemical monitoring should be done at uh, frequent intervals. So uh, parental nutrition is ineffective and probably harmful in cancer patients in whom oral and enteral feeding is possible. So if patient is feeling uh, hungry, patients should be provided food uh, either orally or enterally. Until unless uh, TPN is only indicated if patient is not able to take food orally or enterally. Uh, parental nutrition is recommended in patients with severe mucositis, either radiation-induced mucositis or enteritis, and in those who cannot meet their energy and protein requirement exclusively via oral diet or enteral feeding. Now, after uh, enteral and parental nutrition, let us see what, uh, what is the role of hydration in terminally ill patients. So uh, there are certain points in favor of hydration and certain points against hydration. Hydration can be provided in patients 
to Im uh, improve patient's comfort. Hydration improves delirium and renal failure. Hydration uh, improves delirium if it is due to opioid toxicity and uh, certain group of patients present uh, to us who are in terminal illnesses having hypercalcemia. So uh, hydration can correct hypercalcemia as well. What are the points against uh, hydration is if patient is comatose, do not provide hydration. Hydration can prolong death. Uh, hyd hydration should not be provided in lung secretions, GA secretions, edema and ascites. And hydration should not be provided uh, <clears throat> for, uh, if there is reduced diuresis and less mobilization. Now, uh, uh, once we have done our uh, nutritional assessment and we have provided nutrition, what is the uh, how we are going to uh, how we are going to uh, do all these uh, assessments and uh, interventions? So first, we will do nutritional assessment using nutritional screening and assessment tool, and then we will be uh, identifying the uh, what are the concerns of patient and family. Then we will be integrating nutritional uh, methods in plan of care. And after integrating nutritional methods, we would be re-evaluating whether our goals has been achieved or not. So after this entire discussion, we will be coming back to our case again. So uh, the case was, it is a 60-year-old male, known case of metastatic carcinoma esophagus. Patient has underwent chemo and radiotherapy. Currently on best supportive care in view of progressive decline in performance status. Current P ECOG PS is 4. Uh, patient presents to palliative medicine OPD with complaints of progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids both and he vomits every time he eats since last one week. So uh, provisionally, uh, this patient looks like there is an obstruction at the level of esophagus and because of that patient is not able to uh, eat. Uh, anything. So <clears throat> even we we, uh, we can ask the patient whether patient is uh, tolerating a little bit of liquid or not. Uh, the anthropometric parameters are suggestive of height 1.65 meters, weight 42 kg and weight loss in last three months is 20 kg. Sarcopenia is present, lab values are sodium 126, potassium 3.6 and albumin 2.8. Now uh, let us see whether this patient is malnourished or not. So we would be using malnutrition universal screening tool to assess whether there is malnourishment or not. So the first prime, uh, first parameter used in uh, MUST is BMI score. So uh, considering our patient, the BMI score is less than 18.5. So the score would be two. BMI score would be two for this patient. Second is weight loss score. So uh, our patient was uh, has lost 20 kgs and current weight is 42. So 30% uh, of weight loss in last uh, five months, five, six months. So uh, this indicates uh, a score of two. So BMI score is two, weight loss score is two. And third is whether the acute disease, uh, uh, if patient is acutely ill and there has been or is likely to, to be no nutritional intake for more than five days. So our patient is not eating for more than seven days. So here also the score would be two. Now, adding all these scores, two from BMI, two from weight loss, and two from acute disease effect score, the total score becomes six. So let us see how it is classified. If the score is zero, there is low risk of malnutrition. If the score is one, the risk of malnutrition is medium. And if the score is more than equal to two, the risk of malnutrition is very high. Now, if we, we sometimes we do not have time in our OPDs to assess the patient in detail, uh, as far as nutritional uh, nutrition is concerned. So we can decide on these scores and we can plan intervention as per these scores as well. So uh, if score is zero, low risk patient, so routine clinical care is advised and repeated screening should be done. If patient is having hospital visits, we can do weekly. Uh, if patient is at home care, we can do uh, monthly. And if patient is in community level, uh, annual assessment can be done. If the score is one, patient is in medium risk. So, and uh, our strict observation should be made. Dietary intake should be documented uh, in last three days. And if it is found inadequate, it becomes a little concern of uh, little concern to manage. Uh, repeated screening should be done uh, weekly in hospital uh, settings, uh, 
monthly in home setting and two to three monthly in community settings. And if uh, uh, it is find out, it, it is found to be inadequate, nutrition is inadequate, then we should uh, start setting up goals and providing uh, nutrition to this patient. And third is if the score is more than two, the patient is in high risk of malnutrition, this patient needs to be treated. So this patient should be referred to dietitian, nutritional support team, and uh, implement various nutritional uh, methods and policies. Uh, improve and increase overall nutritional intake in this patient. Monitor uh, this patient more strictly. In hospital setting, it should be monitored weekly. In home care setting, it should be monitored monthly. And in community settings also, it should be monitored monthly. So our patient has a score of six. So our patient needs a nutritional support. <clears throat> Once the patient has been screened, the second step is to assess whether it is uh, actually there or not. And uh, this, details, uh, de uh, this detailed uh, assessment can be done by using subjective global assessment form. So this is the SGA form which we are also using at our institute. So when we apply this form, our patient turns out to have a severe malnourishment. Now coming back to the case, Uh, so, uh, since this patient is having a carcinoma esophagus, the first thing we can plan is to put a nasal tube, either to a nasogastric or nasogenal, whatever, uh, whatever site is free. So, uh, we can try and attempt to put a Riles tube. If it is not going, we can plan a fluoroscopy guided Riles tube insertion or endoscopic guided Riles tube insertion. If that also fails, then we should go uh, downwards and we should think of uh, putting some gastrostomy uh, gastrostomy tube to this patient. So if scope is not passing through esophagus, then the next option is to put surgically uh, placed gastrostomy tube. And so certain times, uh, these patients present with uh, some obstruction also at the level of uh, gastric outlet or at the level of duodenum or uh, in the small intestinal part. So if that is there, then we can put the patient on uh, uh, jejunostomy tubes also. Uh, total parental nutrition would not be advisable. TPN should not be advisable in this patient as this patient is, uh, this patient is losing weight uh, very uh, drastically. Performance status is four and patient is currently on best supportive care. So expect uh, if we calculate expected survival, it would be less than six weeks if we uh, put uh, patients all the details in palliative performance index and we can find out the survival, it would be less than six weeks. So in that condition, total parental nutrition should not be advisable for this patient. So uh, this is uh, what this presentation was about nutrition. Thank you. So thank you, Sanjeev. It's a very comprehensive uh, detail about uh, nutritional requirements and what is exactly nutrition is. So the house is open for discussion. If we have any questions, uh, we have not received any question in the chat box. Uh, uh, Seema ma'am, are you there? Yes, Vinod. Yeah, ma'am, uh, would you like to uh, say uh, your experience regarding uh, enteral nutrition or nutritional uh, requirement in terminally stage patients? Okay, so first of all, thank you, Sanjeev, and thank you, Vinod, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, very comprehensively, I think Sanjeev has really rich time. And regarding our practical experience, uh, most of the time, we encourage the patient to take orally as much as patients able to take it. We don't go for the many uh, invasive procedures. And uh, if the patient is totally not able to take it all, then we go for minimal invasive, like twice to feet. If the patients and the attendants, when we explain everything, and then then they still they want that invasive procedure should be done, mm -hmm. then we go for the uh, rise tube insertion. And the third is, which is the last one, which we go for the PEG. Either initially the patients are waiting for any uh, anti-cancer therapy. This is a usual practical approach in our setting we are doing in advanced cancer. 
for terminal patients our protocol is there we explain the patient attendant and they try to take as much as possible orally this is a usually routine approach to our patients uh, if any senior faculty is there which i'm not able to see if any they want to add there anything in this they can do it uh, dr jennifer jeba is there ma'am uh, would you like to share your experience in such patients jennifer ma'am Uh, Dr. Dr. Stanley, Stanley, sir. Yeah. Uh, Good morning, sir. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, thank you. That was a uh, very excellent presentation, Sanjeev. Uh, lovely ideas of presentation, and uh, I've learned a lot of how to present so nicely. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things, mainly from the home care point of view. Uh, one is to stress on the family, no force feeding, because by the time they are in that kind of state, the risk of aspiration and coughing and vomiting, causing all those kind of uh, metastatic pain, you know, in the ribs and the various things. So that has to be avoided. So no force feeding is something. And to make eating a family occasion, you know, a happy occasion, that's one thing. Another thing is a practical difficulty if there is a longer prognosis is the problem of taste alteration. Taste alteration is a very uh, challenging problem in, in these patients. And it, it uh, you know, the, the, the uh, wife would like to make his favorite food, but then he tastes, takes one morsel and says, ah, I don't like it, you know. And it's very, very hurting for her, very challenging for her. So this kind of thing, when you explain to them, they understand. The third thing I want to mention is we found that just giving, when the problem is a little more, you know, like eight weeks or so, uh, if you give DEXA, you know, just four to eight milligrams subcut once a week or once in four or five days, you know, it gives them a sense of well being. It gives them a little uh, stimulation of appetite. It, uh, the, it doesn't add to the uh, tablet burden. You know, you don't have to keep giving too many extra tablets. You know? So just one shot of DEXA three, every four or five days. They, some, because some of these patients you know, and, and family, they are waiting for us to come, you know, so that they can have that injection because they found it very helpful. So it gives them a sense of well-being also. So those are some points. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, sir, for elaborating your experience. Uh, Actually, what do I feel is that if, if the patient is not taking nutrition, either due to uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy or because of cancer cachexia, and it is uh, leading to malnutrition, malnutrition, then we should uh, supplement in some way or other way, whether it is enteral nutrition, parental nutrition, or by giving some <coughs> drugs, whether it is dexamethasone, medoxyprogesterone, anything towards uh, terminal stages, so that they will be fed. And this should be comfort feeding rather than we should be targeting uh, nutritional parameters. So that will, the idea is to improve the quality of life and to decrease the stress of the caregivers because caregiver feels at times that uh, since patient is not eating, he is starving. So we need to give them, uh, we need to explain that patient's requirement is very less at towards the end of life or towards in terminal stages. So he won't require that much of nutrition. So we should avoid uh, overfeeding in such cases. Uh, we should give maybe a little amount of food and in frequent intervals, we should increase the frequency multiple times. Then uh, we should, by these measures, we may improve their quality of life and satisfaction of the caregiver as well. Dr. Minakshi, uh, Dr. Minakshi, you have raised hand. Uh, like thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, I just wanted to ask a question. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Sandhu. A lot of uh, new information. And <clears> just like Dr. Sandhu said, uh, super presentation skills. Um, my question is here, like uh, when, uh, when we are talking about a prognosis of, say, around six months or so, uh, that is when, you know, uh, advanced uh, head and neck cancers just put on OMC. Um, and, uh, you know, that we are looking at six months to a year probably. So uh, there's a lot of questions on, uh, doctor, can you give something to, give some tonic for improving appetite? Uh, doctor, can you, uh, shall we give him calcium? 
shall we give multivitamins? So uh, what is the uh, evidence for these uh, uh, practices uh, is my question. Thank you. Dr. Sanjeev, would you like to answer this? Uh, good morning, ma'am. So uh, as far as all these micronutrients are considered, uh, concerned, whether it is calcium or iron or uh, any kind of therapy, so if patient is having deficiency of any of it, whether patient is iron deficient, patient is anemic, patient is having hypocalcemia, then we can definitely provide supplemental uh, calcium and iron and other micronutrient substances. Certain times uh, we are not able to assess whether uh, there is a multivitamin deficiency or not. Like we can measure some, some vitamins, but we cannot measure all the vitamins. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, to be on the safer side, we can provide uh, multivitamins as well to uh, to supplement the patient's vitamin requirements. But uh, as such, uh, there is uh, not a very uh, clear-cut guideline where we can start uh, these nutritional supplements or not. Even ESPN or ASPN guideline, that is also not very clear about. They are just saying that it, these are the recommendations that can be used. They are not telling that these are the... Uh, uh, guidelines or these are the uh, methods which should be used. So uh, uh, it is a very kind of uh, blurred line. There are a lot of parameters, ethical dilemmas are there. There are cost uh, uh, effectiveness should be there. Patient should be affording. So uh, keeping in mind, if patient needs, patient requires that, we can uh, decide uh, on a very uh, patient to patient basis, personal basis. Uh, but there is no uh, universal guideline for that. Uh, I would like to say that uh, most you. of these patients uh, who are having head and neck cancer patients, they are unable to eat anything most of the times. And they have been found, if we measure their uh, vitamins or nutrients, they are bound to have deficiencies most of the times. So there is no harm in supplementing some of the nutrient, but we couldn't find any literature regarding that. But there is no harm in giving multivitamin like B complex. And if we talk about vitamin D or calcium, uh, maybe we can give it for one week, then hold it for another two weeks, maybe supplement for one week like this. We may give because overdosing of certain like vitamin D, uh, we can't give. Uh, it may lead to hypervitaminosis D or in that way, we can supplement to a certain extent, depending on that. And we should have, we should measure actually serum level of multi, all those vitamins, vitamin B12, B6, vitamin D. So that is one thing we can think of. And in addition, we may give a trial of uh, medroxyprogesterone or all those anabolic hormones. If for three to, I mean, for six to 12 weeks, we can give to all patients who are complaining of uh, loss of appetite or decreased appetite or complaining of anorexia, then that may be given in those patients, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any more questions, please? Uh, Dr. Vinod and yes, Dr. Sanjeev, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we've overshot time. So yeah. Any closing comments, please? Uh, as uh, Dr. Sanjeev has already said, and Dr. Seema and Dr. Stanley has collaborated. So I feel that uh, nutritional supplement, uh, I mean, nutrition should be given based on the patient's comfort towards end of uh, terminal stages. And uh, it's not be like the, we should be feeding and the psychological components should be taken care in all patients. Uh, why, why they are not eating, that should be tackled in all patients. So with this uh, closing thoughts, I think we should uh, close this discussion now. We are over setting time. So thank, thank you. you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, ma'am. Stanley, thank sir, sir. ma'am, and Minakshi, ma'am, and Nisha and Archana. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll meet thank again you. next Monday. Thank you. Have a good week. Yeah.